clear rivers and lakes and streams. Like the land itself, water is part of our heritage. And the way we use the land affects our waters. Rain brings life to the land. Looking at the forest, a canopy of leaves breaks the force of falling rain. Plants on the forest floor shelter the soil. Roots bind it together. Spongy topsoil soaks up the rain. Trees and plants take up some of the rainwater. The rest seeps into the ground and slowly wends its way to the forest stream. Out of the undisturbed forest, streams run clean and clear. Logging disrupts the forest's natural capacity to deliver clean water. The protective canopy falls with the timber. Heavy logging equipment packs down the absorbent topsoil. cover plants are scraped away under skidded logs. The compacted forest floor can no longer absorb the rain. The exposed soil works loose and is carried away by runoff water. Down the slopes to the forest stream. Until the forest heals, the stream cannot recover. Strip mining has laid bare two million acres of the eastern forest. Coal for power from the hills of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, more coal every year. Stripped land, unprotected soil, steep slopes. Mining wastes and soil wash off the land and move downstream with the water. One-fourth of this country is tilled every year. Bare soil in spring on three billion acres. One spring after another. Generation after generation. Without plant cover, the soil is exposed to the full force of the rain. Small soil particles are easily swept away in the runoff.
spring rains are the most destructive. Frozen land absorbs no water. Heavy spring rains and melting snow run over the surface of the land. Fertile topsoil is carried in the runoff and dumped into streams or lakes. Streets and rooftops, asphalt and concrete. The ground beneath the city is sealed off. It cannot absorb water. surfaces, off rooftops and parking lots, the rain carries debris to the streets, down the gutters to the storm sewers, channeling storm water directly into a stream or lake. city's sprawling fringe, the land is bulldozed to make way for new subdivisions. During the long months of construction, the soil lies open to the rain. In some places, more soil is lost from building sites than from all other parts of the city combined. From the land to the streets. From the streets to the storm sewers. A rapid transit line to the river or lake that drains the city. Displaced soil ends up in a river channel or harbor. It has to be removed. Dredging is a slow job. Night and day, a bucket at a time, week after week. Half a billion dollars every year to dredge sediment from the nation's waterways. soil from the land. 
Runoff samples reveal other contaminants too, many of them invisible to the eye. Laboratory work on chemicals in runoff is only beginning. The early findings are disturbing. Each year, 200,000 pounds of lead are washed from San Francisco into the bay. thousand pounds of mercury from Washington streets into the Potomac. 80,000 pounds of copper from Atlanta. 300,000 pounds of zinc from Oakland, California. Chromium, arsenic, nickel, cadmium all find their way into our waters. The effects of these chemicals are largely unknown. Some may settle harmlessly to the bottom. Others are dissolved in the water. There is still much to learn about these toxic elements. We know that increasing amounts enter our waters with runoff, in some areas far more than we permit industries to discharge. Some of these chemicals are known to be hazardous, even in minute amounts we know where some chemicals are coming from. Pesticides and weed killers used on farmland can be carried by wind and runoff to lakes and streams. Other chemicals settle onto the land from factory and power plant smokestacks. Lead, contained in some gasoline, passes unburned through automobile engines and settles onto the streets. leaves decomposing on city streets, farm fertilizers and manure are all rich in plant nutrients such as phosphorus. If these nutrients make their way into streams, they stimulate the growth of weeds and algae and speed a natural process known as eutrophication. Professor Arthur Hassler has studied lake problems for more than 40 years. He explains. Lakes reflect the drainage basin in which they lie in their fertility. If the drainage basin is fertile, the lake is fertile. If you increase the fertility of the drainage basin, you increase the fertility of the lake. This lake is eutrophic and has been eutrophic for thousands of years. Man, however, has increased its fertility and has produced certain imbalances that make it less uh, attractive, less aesthetic. It has, however, become excessively fertile in recent years owing to man's activities. The drainage from agricultural land, the manure from spread on the land, the fertility of the land, the erosive materials of the land contribute to this richness. Also the city dwellings and the activities in the city contribute fertility to the lake. Scums form on the surface that are repulsive, especially when they decompose large aquatic Populations grow up from the bottom and cl clog up the, the inshore areas and make the lake less accessible to public use. These imbalances also disturb the underwater community of a lake. As algae and weeds die and decompose, they use up oxygen. When oxygen levels decline, fish populations change. Biologists study these changes by stunning fish with an electric shocker they find that as eutrophication progresses, trout and other game fish disappear. 
rough fish and bottom feeders, whose oxygen requirements are low, begin to take over. Harvesting the overgrowth of weeds or killing them with chemicals treats some of the symptoms of eutrophication, but does not eliminate the cause. These lake treatments are costly and often ineffective. The search for a more lasting remedy is focusing attention on the source of these water contaminants, on the land itself. In the Dust Bowl days of the 1930s, soil erosion was seen as a serious threat to farmland. Through conservation programs started then, we've learned ways of keeping soil on the land. Today, we're looking to many of these same practices to help protect our lakes and streams. Plowing with the contour of sloping fields allows rainwater to be trapped between rows. The chisel plow leaves roots and plant stubble on the surface of the field. This helps cushion the erosive force of rainfall and allows more water to be absorbed into the soil. Lifting the plow over runoff channels leaves a grassy mat to protect the soil. Practices like these protect valuable topsoil while they reduce sedimentation of streams and lakes. But controlling sediment helps control other pollutants too. Many nutrients and toxic chemicals attach themselves to tiny particles of soil. Where the soil is allowed to wash free, it carries these pollutants to lakes and streams. Mulching helps protect disturbed soil. If the soil stays where it belongs, these contaminants can be kept out of the water. On one development site, the muddy runoff was trapped behind a small dam. The soil particles settled out. In a year's time, 10 feet of sediment built up in the trap, sediment that would have polluted this stream. Runoff from this parking lot is funneled into a settling pond. Sediment is trapped along with a variety of nutrients and other chemicals. Barnyards and feedlots can be rebuilt to keep manure out of nearby streams and lakes. Manure can be liquefied and stored through the winter in holding tanks. After the spring thaw, it is spread and worked into the soil before it can be carried away by the rains. A solution? Maybe so. But difficult questions remain. Who should pay for a costly manure handling system? The farmer alone? Or should all who benefit from the improved water quality share the expense? How can we make sure that city and farm people are treated fairly? And who should be in charge? The states or the federal government? Or is this a task for local communities? More important, who should decide how our lakes and rivers should be managed? How can people make their ideas known? We're making headway cleaning up the wastes from factories and sewage plants. But we're just beginning to curb pollution from runoff. We cannot expect our waterways to improve overnight. We have changed the land gradually over more than 200 years. Now it's left to us to do what the land once did by itself, to keep our waters clean. <laughs>